Welcome back to DxO Tutorials. Today we are going to uh, attempt to do the most comprehensive, in-depth, uh, maybe not in-depth, but most comprehensive, uh, straightforward tutorial. Let's get going working with this program uh, to date. So let's get going. Uh, when you open DxO, this is what you're going to see. You probably won't see an image here. It'll say no image currently displayed or available. And that is because you're Notice at the top here, you are in photo library mode. Uh, you have this whole tree here. It is just the same tree you see on your computer's window system. We're working with Windows here, by the way. So everything you see as far as menus will uh, pertain to Windows. Mac is a little bit different looking. Anyways, you will see your typical uh, tree layout. You will go to whatever folder. Did you hear me? Whatever folder you have your picture in and choose your picture. Uh, your entire library or your entire computer is your library and your library is your computer. So anywhere that image is, is where you will select it. And where you selected that image, that folder, is exactly where DxO is going to put the metadata file, all the information for that edit. Is that cool or what? So one more time, when you pick an image in a folder, the, the editing data is going right back next to that image. In fact, the editing data will be named. It'll be the exact number. It'll be DxO with the exact number of the image, the raw image that you edited, making it very simple, very easy to keep track of your stuff. So once you decide what image you would like to bring in, in this case, we have this little birdie on the beach. You need to be aware that DxO is going to do some things automatically if you want it to. So if you want to follow me to preferences, we're going to go up to edit down to preferences as you saw me do. Not waiting for you, of course. <laughs> we have a, a couple things you want to be aware of. First of all, you're going to want to look at all these and check it out, read, read, read. But most importantly, uh, these two settings right here that I'm circling with the mouse right here, correction settings. These are default uh, corrections that will happen uh, if you would like them to, given each type of image. So I have it set up specifically for, two, for a specific reason here, and I'll explain it. My raw images that I bring in, for you folks who don't know what a raw image is, it is an unedited image. I have it on DxO standard. So here are your corrections. DxO standard is just going to do very basic adjustments. It's going to do a basic sharpening based on the optics of the lens used. It's going to take care of chromatic aberrations. It's going to take care of any vignetting, vignetting and uh, a couple other things. Uh, any distortion, I think that's about it. Distortion, and oh, it's going to also add smart lighting. So it's just going to apply just a uniform smart light right across. Uh, doesn't matter if there's a person in it, it's just going to be uniform smart lighting right across the picture. And that is how I have it set up for every raw image that I import into DxO. Now, when you go to RGB images, so we're talking about TIFFs, we're talking about J, uh, JPEGs, I have it set up a bit differently. I have it set up to no correction at all. The reason for this is because quite often in my workflow, I will use other programs such as uh, Luminar, for instance. Uh, once I have used Luminar and uh, exported a JPEG, for instance, uh, sometimes I just want to use DxO, for instance, just for a watermark. I don't want to bring in a JPEG and have DxO apply all those corrections to that poor compressed JPEG because it will absolutely ruin your picture. So that is why I have this bottom RGB images to no correction, allowing me to easily just bring in those JPEGs, throw the watermark on it and be done with it. That said, let's get started guys. Uh, here is the image. If you wanna look at the other parts of that preference menu, uh, feel free. There are different, uh, here are the different behaviors that will be shown or basically the information shown when you hover over your libraries. So when I hover over the uh, 
library photos this is the information that will be on off and how it behaves it's all very uh, pretty much self-explanatory let's just get started on using and editing with DXO first thing you're going to want to do when you've selected your image is go to customize to put the DXO in the editing mode and you can see we're in the editing mode now and I will just maximize our space uh, there are various modules you uh, can see on the left hand side here with the view so just check out your view overlay and you can customize what you see and uh, what you want to see you can hide your palette show palettes etc uh, right now I just have the history uh, and the histogram and there is a little zoom picture of uh, our image so let's go ahead and get to work there is also I don't you don't see it here but you can bring up a, a view so you can add um, your name excuse me you can add metadata to the file your name and author and all that stuff the date let's get started editing the image uh, nice little beach scene uh, how we want to start here is going to our light tab on the far left and uh, what I like to do when I have an image is first ask myself well what does it need what what does the image need to make it look right uh, and so let's just start at the top and we'll add some contrast of course 13 looks pretty good getting going here uh, when you see a uh, micro contrast wow look at that little blue button on the side that is an auto function so that is one of quite a few uh, modules or tools in which DxO has uh, decided for you the optimum setting for the micro contrast. Uh, micro contrast is a very powerful little tool here, so you, you want to be judicious with it. So we have our contrast on 16. I'm going to let DxO take care of the micro contrast. Uh, Clearview Plus, that is a very powerful little filter too. I don't really like what it does to water necessarily in foregrounds I do like what it does to backgrounds let's see what it does to this image not bad makes the whole image really pop right there you know I think I'll just in this case I will leave it on this entire image so we'll just leave Clearview Plus at what 25 a lot of times if I like something at a certain level I'll use I'll, I'll notice that level and then bring it down a bit so if i like that at 25 i'm going to bring it down to 20. and i'm so we have the uniform so just uniform uh smart lighting which is straight across the screen but uh, we have this little birdie here which is basically the focal point of this image so i'm going to go to spot weighted if i were to go to spot weighted while there was a person there there is a very good chance uh, that DxO would detect the person's face and apply proper lighting to their face uh, in this case there is a bird there and DxO is not detecting the bird so we're gonna click on the spot uh, spot weighted tool here we're gonna we can zoom in the bird if you need to we're gonna just going to click and hold put a nice little square over this bird and now the spot weighted lighting knows it's going to light up this side of the bird here now if you got it wrong you can just come right here and go right and click that little X and start over perhaps uh, you don't want any spot weighted or maybe uh, you'd like to put the emphasis maybe on this rock right here where a crab might be sitting now you can see it is a uh, put light emphasis on the side of the rock maybe I just want to uh, bring out some detail so for whatever reason I want to use the tool I can just light the whole rock if I like and just bring out detail in that rock so in this case I don't think I'm gonna need it so much I think I'm, I'll just apply it to uh, this back of the bird here because the front of the bird you can see is already almost blowing out so let's just throw some on the back of the bird and we will be done with that so let's see we've done a contrast some clear view plus two uh two very powerful filters right there smart lighting we've been through that if i wanted to increase the smart lighting of course there are the presets just basically 
slight, medium, strong. And then you can uh, adjust the filter if you'd like and increase it yourself. So we'll just leave it right there. And we're gonna get them into our, what they call a selective tone. So all very familiar adjustments. We'll bring the highlights down. And while we're working with highlights, we can just go ahead and take a look at our shadow and highlight detection. The shortcuts for shadow and highlight detection uh, would be Control B for your shadow. And for highlights, Control W. And as you can see, it engages those. Of course, since I took this picture myself, the exposure is relatively okay. <laughs> but uh, you could, it's an easy way to remember those it would be uh, Control B, so black for shadows, and then uh, W would be white, so Control W for highlights, white. Anyways, that's how I remember them. So uh, shortcuts, and uh, we can just go ahead and bring our shadows straight up to a point we're happy with. I've got some detail coming out of this rock here. Looks pretty good at 22. And I will figure out where my midtones want to be. I'm looking pretty happy. And there is your auto vignette. This is not a vignetting tool, by the way. This is you cannot add a vignette with this tool. This is not what it is about. It is basically removing any vignetting that was applied or by or added by your lens or whatever happened when you took the picture there. Let us move on to the next tab here, which is your color tab. Hey, let's back up to light, by the way. Did we ever add a gradient to our top? No, we didn't. So what I wanna do is just work on that sky. I completely forgot about our sky, so let's work on that. We're gonna add our first local adjustment here, which involves uh, using a control point. So. Using control points is really, really easy. Do not be intimidated by control points. Uh, we're gonna go to local adjustments. And uh, because right now you'll see these feathering and all this at the top, it's because I am in the race mode. So it's offering me this. But if you right click on that, you can see I'm in um, a race mode. These are all your tools. If you have any questions, you can just hit right there and brings up this box to explain the shortcuts to these tools. But let's just go back and we are going to, in this case, select a gradient. Why am I selecting the gradient? Well, because this picture has a flat horizon. So this flat horizon, there's no buildings, there's no trees, it's not busy at all. It's an excellent, excellent, uh, use for a, a gradient. It's just a perfect perfect reason to use a gradient. So let's right click on this gradient tool. I'm gonna go right to the top here and left click. I'm gonna bring the gradient down. Actually, I'm gonna, I think I'm just gonna back up there and let's start from Oh, right there and bring it down. And now we'll just take our exposure down a bit. Yeah. And now while we have this gradient in place, uh, we can do a number of things. We can uh, use any other tools. So whether we wanna add color to the sky, contrast to the sky, uh, we can make any local adjustments that this gradient is currently covering. So in fact, we can do one more in that we can actually, and you can't do this with any other gradient, I'll tell you what, uh, we can actually go to erase. And we can erase any part of the gradient we want. 
So we can actually go in here, increase our brush size, and literally, if you don't like your gradient down in your water, we can just erase the gradient right here. Isn't that fun? I can't think of any other. We can erase it off our mountains even. So we'll just get rid of the gradient that is uh, kind of dampening our already dampened hazy mountains. And it doesn't have to be perfect. So there you go. I just uh, erased whatever gradient was on our water. And we'll go ahead and uh, we can add some more color to our skies. And we'll just saturate them. I don't normally, I'm not a big fan of saturation, but we'll go ahead and add some vib more vibrancy there to our skies. I don't remember if we, no, we haven't used the color panel yet, I don't think. So, just to add into our skies, I'm going to just bring the temperature, the Kelvin down to of our sky, just to blue it up a bit. That's nice. And uh, I really uh, have no interest in sharpening skies, so I'm just going to leave that just like that. And uh, isn't that amazing how many things you can just do with a gradient, whether you want to erase the gradient, add color, sharpen, uh, whatever you want to do, one gradient, and we've pretty much doctored our skies up. So let's move on here. And we have our color panel. And we'll just start by adding some vibrancy, some global vibrancy to the entire image. I already added some vibrancy into our sky and some saturation, and we're just going to add some more. I don't see why not in this case. It doesn't uh, seem to be having any uh, negative effects. So let's just keep going here. Uh, our birds looking really good. I'm liking uh, yeah what I see so far. So let's go down. What I'm worried about here is uh, this is the color wheel, and we will go over that. Very very powerful. Basically, it's just like HSL. You're going to uh, just pick whatever tone you want to affect, and you can change the uh, the tonals of that tone. You can adjust that, that color, the tones of that color, uh, as you want using this wheel. Uh, save that for another day. I want to just bring the temperature down just about like that. More like how I saw it. A little bit cooler. Beautiful. Beautiful. Moving back up to the top. We move to the basically sharpness panel. And uh, you can see right here, without me touching anything, chromatic aberration it is already checked off as a default. And uh, if you remember, the vignetting was already checked off as well. You can see that the intensity uh, is set to its own level. It's taking care of everything. Uh, I am a Micro Four Thirds shooter, so this is not really a noisy image you can see, but just for kicks and for cleanliness and fun, I think I will just go ahead and use the prime denoise. Just kind of do that as a standard if I can, if I see fit. Let's talk about sharpness. Remember, DxO does sharpen your image according to the optics of your lens. You have optic lens modules there. So it is sharpening even the, uh, the lesser sharp areas of your lens, which is uh, the edges. So you have a very sharp center of a lens, but the edges of a lens tend to be less sharp than the other areas of the lens. So DxO is you know, taking special care of these areas to make sure your image looks optimal. However, uh, you do have a global sharpening tool that you can't take advantage of and we'll just move that up 
I don't want to make it too crispy. So we'll just move that at maybe 90, 80. A friend of mine uses 150. I just kind of hold back because uh, oftentimes I will bring images into, say, Luminar later on and tweak it there. So I just kind of tend to hold back on the sharpening. Very, very judicial, judicial, ju judicial. You know what I'm trying to say. Let's tweak the details just a little bit. If you move down, you can also see within the sharpening tools, unsharp mask. Not really recommended for editing raw images. Uh, arm sharp mask. It's not actually sharpening. It's not an actual sharpening tool, but it is more of a uh, illusion, uh, a pixel illusion that gives the impression or the uh, the perception that an image like a JPEG that has been heavily compressed already is being sharpened. Um, so I tend to stay away from that M sharp mask, and we'll just uh, skip that altogether. So this is looking really nice so far. Uh, what we can do, I don't really see any need to. Yeah, I was going to uh, maybe just do a little work on the side here, but what we'll do is we'll just go back over to light. And I'm wondering if there's any detail to be had right here. And, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bring the exposure down completely. And it doesn't look like there's really anything there to be had at all. So that said, I'll just bring this back up to where we started. And we'll just leave that bird happily at the original exposure. Might take a second to adjust. Poor little computer here. Oh, you know why? It's because I, uh, yeah. Here we go. So we have our bird back. Excuse me there, guys. And uh, basically, as you can see, there was really no detail to be gained from the uh, lowering the exposure on that. So we'll just leave that. We use our shortcuts to turn that uh, highlight detection off. Uh, I uh, basically like what I see. I don't see any reason to, uh, to tweak anything else. If there were a, uh, say, well, let's go to, before we get into that, let's just go over to uh, geometry and quickly discuss if we needed to crop and in this case I don't see any reason to crop anything if you were going to crop it here's your crop tool and you put you in crop mode by bringing this little box down here you have your basically default you know presets there and in constrained would just be the same as free so you can just select your own crop but in this case we are not going to crop anything uh, and we are going to take a quick look well we didn't do any control points so we're not really going to look we did one control point and that is what this really module is all about so just for kicks let's do a control point so we can watch one go in right here to do that really you need to go into local adjustments mode once more now really quick the rule of thumb with control points is that when you're using them, you always want to right click and add a new mask layer. If you do not add the new mask layer, the new control point you add will be con connected to the first control point you added. So if you add a control point and fail to add a mask layer, the next control point you add will immediately take on the same edits and and apply the apply the exact same edits as that first control point. And 
anything you do to that first control point from then on will take effect on that second control point. And if you fail to add a new mask at that point and add a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, all those control points will take on the same edits and be controlled by the very first control point until you add a new mask layer. That is the rule. However, gradients are different. Gradients are, are completely separate and do not require a new control point or excuse me, a new mask layer. That said, I you just saw me apply a new mask layer anyways. Let's just go ahead and right click because I really want to show you how uh, this fills up with different control points. So we're just going to right click on this and we're just going to hit control point and we're just going to add some phony control points right here. So here's one. Now, if you've never used uh, DxO before, what you're looking for is tones. I think I went over this in, uh, in, a, in a, an, another a tutorial here. So say this part of the sky I still think is a bit too white or I want to bring some color. I want to try to get some blue in this part of the sky. What I would do is um, I would just place this on the tone that I want to change in that area there. And then I'm just going to pull this out to the area I want to affect it. Now, all I have to do is just bring this up to the tool I want and then just bring it down and you can see it affecting that area. A little bit heavy handed. So now you have a control point. So now that this control point is there, if I were just to go over and just click on something else, it'll automatically apply this exposure change to that area. So say I decide this area needs the same thing. You can see once I click, boom, it just did it automatically because these are connected. Now, if I were to go over here and raise the exposure, you can see both areas are, are raising in unison. So you basically have little dimmer lights you just applied. Uh, I've seen no reason to do it for this, but we're going to go ahead and just keep adding control points. So we're just going to right click new layer and I'm going to put a control point here and I'll just shut that down and I'm going to go new layer and put one here, one here and a new layer. I think this rock might do good with a control point. Who knows what you might do with that and connect the rock to uh, this whatever little bird up here. Because we might want to bring him out. Another one here and connect that. Uh, new. So we're making a big mess here, as you can see. We have stuff flying everywhere. How are we going to keep track of all this? Now, to keep track of it, first of all, you're going to be you're going to need to be in local adjustments. If you are not in local adjustments and you are just looking at your image like this, and uh, say you're doing this and that, and you want to look at, well, let's look at what I have here in control points. You can go ahead and it's not doing anything. You need to be in local adjustments. So put yourself in local adjustments. Once you are there, you see all this, uh, but you're thinking, oh, wow. Uh, you can just easily hover over any of this. So it's listed graduated filter, hover over any of these, and it'll show you those are grouped. There's your three group. Remember the insane, I was attaching the rock to the clouds, to the clouds. And you can see all the insanity uh, you put on your picture laid out right there. It shows you very easily, so you can easily just isolate that control point, and there it is, so you can work on it. There's the three control points, so you can work on it. You can also uh, just click on something and uh, disable it. You can duplicate it. All, all that from right here, you can control this. You can just delete a control point so we can just delete that Del delete that delete that or I could just right click on it and delete it that way so this is a very important tool once you get into your work and it things get you know more complicated images where you're doing a lot of adjustments and things like that uh, big lifesaver and uh, save you from getting very very confused before we uh, head out here let's talk about watermarks in this day and age of digital theft and thievery uh, the watermark tool is very very easy to use uh, you can just look at it and figure it out basically
if you have your own preset watermark you want to use something that you some PDF or something somewhere you have you can just click on image and just hit browser bring up your browser and find it bring it in and you will use the same scale settings that you're going to see me use for my own that I'm going to enter I like to use the DxO watermark uh, just text tool so just click on text now I'm just going to enter uh, my channel name if uh, I get my glasses on here and can see what I'm doing and once that is in place you can just uh, go down and pick your font I have already chosen my favorite font which is uh, in my case bakery you can choose your color I generally go with black or white but hey it's a big big world if you want to choose uh, some sort of pastel or another color feel free to however you want to do your thing is your thing uh, anyways I go with a black and white I think white looks really good with this picture here you have a schematic uh, in which you can rotate the watermark so if you want to do put it like that for instance which I think looks really good or you want to do just put it on the side maybe uh, some might think that that looks pretty cool you can just kind of scale it down personally I prefer to put it uh, just uh, like that upside down no actually I like it uh, just straight on the bottom kind of small once it's uh, down there I prefer to bring down the opacity a bit so that it's not quite so bold and in your face just make it look a little more natural like that then I will bring it just a bit away from the bottom floor and just a little bit away from the right side wall not that far just about that far so it looks natural and if you don't think it looks natural then you will have to apply your own sense of natural to it as you can see you can create your own little presets so if you want to do that as far as how you like your uh, your watermarks overlays uh, it's wonderful anyways feel free to explain just a mat it becomes a matter of creativity from here guys so we just won't go into it feel free to explore the watermark tool uh, moving on let's get out of a little adjustments here and uh, if you look at other videos you can see how various local adjustment tools work like auto mask and mask things like that the, the really the mind frame is that ladies and gentlemen you're looking for tones uh, so you're looking for a tones that you want to change you're looking for a, a whites or a, a not a bright area and you're just telling DxO and in, encircling that area and it's bringing that whole area of all those tones down at once and the beauty is that it feathers all this into the, to everything around it so so your images never have an uneven look to them because everything is constantly being feathered into what's around it within that that circle your that circular area you see it's really genius it's once once you get used to it, it you just really go wow this is quick and and just amazing it's really genius so let's talk about as we get out of here um, we haven't even got into the repair function the repair function is just amazing because uh, it gives you uh, so much control over what you want to uh, erase and how you want to erase things um, you can actually feather your race you can pick areas to because remember when you erase something what's really going on is it's just replacing it with something else that looks like that area that you're trying to to get rid of so in DxO's case when you erase something uh, you can actually pick if you don't like what it picked you can go select your own area and it just use whatever you want uh, we'll get into that on another day because it's getting really long uh, get the demo of this uh, of this editing program you'll really like it mess with it uh, if you have any questions hit me up in the comment box let's talk about how we're gonna get this picture out of here what you can do 
And what I generally do, if you want to use another application, you can export to application. Currently, DxO does not uh, support any other third parties other than the NIC, the NIC collection and uh, Flickr and export to Lightroom, as you can see. But as far as a uh, full plug-in back and forth use, it's not happening. So you export to disk and that'll export to JPEG, TIFF, whatever you want to do there. Or in my case, sometimes it'll export to uh, Luminar, for instance add any creative touches towards the end and uh, I like the way Luminar does skies and some just some easy hit ups uh, I like Luminar for so in this case uh, we would be just uh, exporting to disk and uh, basically that would be the end of it and that is a basic edit uh, did we? T did I tell you? Yeah, I told you at the beginning. Where does this edit go though? Now that it's done, so say I send this image to my documents. Where did DxO put the uh, information for this edit? And it's super easy. Uh, it just put the same number as the raw file on the metadata file and stuck it right next to the same where you found the picture. And to me, that is so perfect because, I mean, that just makes sense. I mean, where you put the picture is where you would expect to find things related to the picture. So if you found the picture in My Vacation 1992, you're going to find the edit information in My Vacation 1992 right next to that raw image that, or the picture that you edited. Uh, I don't know if that works. Maybe some people really don't like that workflow for me that workflow works absolutely perfect i'm just a big picture guy i like to i like to know where everything is and see it all from that view thanks for hanging out guys that is a uh, another dxo edit and i'll see you next time